So welcome everyone, I'm Catherine Palm, the Director of the Labor Archives and Research Center here at San Francisco State. We are hosting today's exhibit and opening program. Uh, we're very fortunate to have this wonderful exhibit. Um, the Labor Archives has wonderful collections in relation to the strike at San Francisco State in 1968. We really collect and document the faculty part of the strike, but we do have much of the material that relates to students as well. And so we have a wonderful collection in the university archives that also documents the students uh, part of the strike. So if you're interested and want to know more, want to do research, please come here. We're here to help you and you can learn so much more. Um, I want to take a moment to also thank Alex Cherian and the Bay Area Television Archives. I think a lot of you saw the wonderful footage that's in the uh, exhibit, and that's all from the Television Archive, and you can view that footage online as well. Um, and then lastly, I do want to put a thank you to the San Francisco Public Library. They hosted um, an amazing exhibit of Fizz's work uh, not too long ago, and it was Ann Carroll um, who had put that exhibit together that was very helpful for me while putting this exhibit together, and Nancy Arm Simon, who also um, co-curated the exhibit. So thanks to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, and I can't not thank Dan Gonzalez as well because he's really the one that put all of this together for the program tonight. <laughs> so thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so just a few things. We have a wonderful uh, set of panelists tonight to, who all lived through this experience and you can learn from them. But I um, want to have first come up uh, Dean Montero from the College of Ethnic Studies to give you a welcome. Catherine, Nancy, thank you for putting this uh, this exhibit together. And I'd, I'd never met Ms. Fizmeza before, but uh, professor, colleague who, because of the, your choices to not sign a particular form that was being foisted upon faculty at the time, you had to give up your position here. And you still continued on teaching, you still continued on with your photography. That kind of dedication and commitment is part of what this strike is uh, presentations about uh, Deborah Masters. The, I see you, that you're uh, the, the director of the library. Thank you for being ha having us in your home. <laughs> and I particularly want to thank also the veteran strikers that are in the room. Uh, would you wave or do some sort of indication because there are a number of them um, who are in the room. I want to thank them because it's a privilege to be able to welcome you here, and my ability to welcome you here is because they're veteran strikers, but they're also founders. They're founders of the College of Ethnic Studies. And um, I actually wasn't here at San Francisco State. I can tell you what they inspired in me. Uh, you know, there's the big strike. This is the strike. This is the largest, longest strike, student strike in history. At any university, there are university archives where you have chancellors or presidents who wrote, fix this, we don't want to <laughs> have to deal. But I was in high school at the time, and you motivated me and a bunch of us students to take over our high school. <laughs> what we should have done is read better. That's why we're in the library. We should have read better. You don't take over a high school and then run into the parking lot that's inside of a horseshoe-shaped <laughs> school and be cut off. So uh, I want to admit that, that I, I probably should have read more and studied more before we all decided to think that we knew what you all were doing out here. And what they were doing out here was important. And I just want to, you, you'll see the 15 demands out there. But as an administrator, I'd like to take a little license here and say that institutionally, it opened doors, created access. It changed the academic climate, and at the core of that, EOP was at the core of that. And it also, uh, there was also a demand to change the intellectual content, and the largest chunk of that was the birth of ethnic studies. It's the largest chunk because there are other things that come and, and bubble out of that. Women's studies bubbles out of that. The various names of the gay and lesbian studies, which is human sexuality and, now, and, and queer studies, those different names bubble out of that. All of that bubbles out of these demands. So it was an interesting and important political decision, an interesting, important collection of organizing that had not been done. And I'm not sure we've done it yet. It's multi-ethnic, cross student, faculty, community, in ways when a demand was put on the system, it had to change. 
to a degree, we're still writing the, fighting the struggle. And what did change? Besides the birth of ethnic studies, and I'll, I'll get to that last, the university is different. The students that are sitting in the room, when you're in a biology class and they're concerned with helping you understand how you might see the impact on various organisms, including humans, in ways that are unjust, came from here. When you're in a health class and they're looking at disparate impact on health, came from here. When you're in a literature class and you're reading anything that wasn't written in either England or New England, <laughs> comes from here. So it changed, not just birth the, uh, the College of Ethnic Studies, but it changed, and then this idea to show that it was so creative. Creative ideas always give birth to more things. The small college with a set of fundamental academics that were put in play becomes a college that now does 6,000 students a semester across 150 sections. And if you're wondering how big that is, because it's the smallest college on campus, you think, oh, it's small. We're the size of about Mills College, and we're larger than the smallest CSU. Okay? We're larger than the Maritime Academy. So, <laughs> right now, it's, 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 but, but the state of California invests in that as one whole campus. And so, what was it? Sorry, yeah, but you're right. It's, it's tiny. So, so I want, when I, when I come here to welcome you uh, to this, this event, I welcome you as the sixth dean of the College of Ethnic Studies. The sixth dean who was in high school at the time, and they were only in, they were only in college, changing the world, and changing the world that gave me an opportunity to be here and to work with amazing students in an amazing place, and I'm very thankful. Thank you, Dean Montero. Um, our next speaker is going to be the photographer whose beautiful work is featured in this ex exhibition. Fiz Mezzi, as uh, Dean Montero mentioned, um, was a faculty member at San Francisco State and in 1950 refused to sign the loyalty oath and along with several other professors and as a consequence was fired um, and became a photographer because basically she was backlisted from being able to do other types of work. And so I have a great deal of respect for Fiz, both for her political stance but also I love her photographs. Her work is very powerful. This is the um, uh, second exhibit that we've had featuring Fizz's work, um, and we're very honored to have her here. And so she's going to come say a few words. When you when you grow up and get old, <laughs> you have to take your wheels with you. <laughs> so, I, as she said, I'm a photographer. I'm not a speaker, and I'm a little bit uh, intimidated by a microphone. Mm -hmm. But I'll I'll try. I just want to share with you tonight. It was such a joy to be back at State uh, and to see all the students that turned out early this evening to see the exhibit and to see what went on and to hear about what went on before their time. And uh, it was a joy to come full cycle and it's very nice to be here tonight. I noticed certain things, little things, that sort of bothered me about the time when, when all of this was going on. And people aren't aware that the silence of the 50s, as described in uh, one of the magazines that there was the silent 50s became a very noisy 60s and 70s. And there was so much going on, I was trying to enumerate some of the things that were happening. And I, I mean, we, were, we had uh, the desegregation of the schools, 
we had the busing issue, we had the auto row strike for better jobs and better recognition, which was won, by the way. You don't win too many. You just make steps forward. And each step you make is a big step. And I think we're well on the way to being a very noisy American audience. But uh, I'm very pleased that I'm here tonight and I'm very pleased that I'm, after all these years, I'm actually back at San Francisco State, which I never stopped loving, even though I was fired here in 1950 or 51, I can't remember. But I know it took me 28 years before I got back to teaching, and that's how long it took for the Supreme Court to make a decision that the Levering Act was illegal non-constitutional, and then all the other years that I haven't really been here, but I've been on campus and on, off campus. And so I'm very proud and happy to be back and to see you, and, I, and, and keep it up. <laughs> Um, and on that note, we want to have um, a student come up and speak to talk about the connection to the present day of the past. What did that strike mean to students today? And so the, we want to welcome Carlos Peterson, who is part of the Ethnic Studies Student <laughs> Association. Good evening. My name is Carlos Peterson Gomez. I'm a transfer student attending my first semester here at San Francisco State University. With the aid of caring counselors at City College, I was gifted the opportunity to explore SF State's campus and furthermore to network with Veronica Garcia, a student and leader here. Veronica in turn introduced me to Phil Klasky, who's a professor at the College of Ethnic Studies. The friendship, support, and inspiration that Veronica and Phil have given me is what has led me to become an intern at the Ethnic Studies Student Resource and Empowerment Center, which is an umbrella organization for student resources. It is very motivating to be part of the first ASI Ethnic Studies student organization. It has been within this network that I have learned more about ethnic studies, what it means, and why it is crucial. My gratitude for all the organizers who made this college's existence possible has simultaneously grown with the number of resources I continue to discover here. Before I had officially enrolled into SF State, Veronica Garcia showed me around the campus. I was inspired and surprised to see a Cesar Chavez Center and a Malcolm X Plaza. When I read the words, we are still here on the Native American mural, I began to more deeply perceive the historical power that Ethnic Studies College has founded here at San Francisco State. Ethnic Studies and the progress it has empowered this university with has given me the opportunity to feel that I am in the right place. In the same way the counselors from CCSF, professors and organizers here at SF State, and members of my community have uplifted and helped me, the College of Ethnic Studies has given me a chance to develop develop academically in a field that encompasses my deeply rooted ambitions to aid my community and my society. As a student of color, it is both healing and unsettling to learn that SF State houses the only College of Ethnic Studies in the entire nation. However, the privilege of being able to come to campus every week and be part of a network of people who believe in teaching and learning our history, as well as in empowering the underrepresented voices of history is consistently motivating. An incredible step towards a more conscious society has been taken here at SF State. The College of Ethnic Studies is an empowerment that pulses far beyond the Bay Area. 
the progressive impact of its establishment is echoed through time. I believe that the College of Ethnic Studies has planted seeds of growth that are inevitably to bloom by the fertility of true education. At the very least, the College of Ethnic Studies has helped me enjoy and immerse myself in my college career. It has invigorated me through disheartening environmental injustice, inspired me amid seas of discouraging media, and clarified my vision of what the worlds of our children will offer them. Society is a living organism, and ethnic studies is a crucial key to healing it from the sicknesses of continuing oppressions and injustices. I am grateful to be able to give thanks to the organizers who have helped in recognizing our histories and their importance, and I am further privileged to thank the professors and staff who continue to make the College of Ethnic Studies a source of empowerment and resistance today. So thank you to all and in solidarity. <laughs> the deep thought and connection of the past to the present. Um, that's what we're all about when we uh, work in archives. So now we're fortunate to move on to the panel. We have an amazing panel here, Clarence Thomas, who is with the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, um, a wonderful speaker. Uh, I've seen you give presentations on the 1934 general strike, uh, an important event. Um, and. Um, Clarence has been uh, this wonderful bridge between the student activism and labor activism um, in the Bay Area. Roger Alvarado, one of the leaders of the Third World Liberation Front, and Maureen Chu, who is a professor in Asian American Studies here at San Francisco State. All three were students during the strike and bring that history to us today. And the moderator of the panel is going to be Dan Gonzalez, who is also a faculty member, a professor uh, in Asian American Studies, um, and a student at the time of the strike. So welcome, Dan, and to the panel. First set of questions is uh, really easy. How'd you get involved? How did it start for you? Who wants to go first? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening, brothers and sisters, friends and comrades. It's really great to be with you this evening to show you how much things have changed for me. I, I can remember when I could make a left turn off of uh, <laughs> 19th on to Holloway. And <laughs> that's just part of the change. <laughs> uh, but I I've done these forums many times and at the risk of, of seeming somewhat redundant, I would like to read something to you because I think that it is important. This is taken from the 1969 Black Fire newspaper that was published by the San Francisco State Black Student Union. The editor was uh, a woman I was married to at the time, uh, Judy Thomas. She's now Judy Juanita, an author in her own right, and the first black woman to be the editor of the Black Panther newspaper. But I want to read something because this sort of sets the tone for what the events at San Francisco State meant to me, and, uh, at the, at, and, and don't, don't want to be presumptuous, but perhaps to others on this panel. One of the most effective confrontations in the history of the U.S. student movement the San Francisco State College strike will no doubt serve as a precedent for future campus disruption. The strike was unique in many ways, differing completely from the events at Columbia University in 1968 or the recent disruptions at Cornell and Harvard. The San Francisco State strike witnessed the formation of new alliances, use of new tactics, and the mobilization of unprecedented support. The effectiveness of the strike can be attributed primarily to the leadership of the San Francisco State College Black Student Union. This is excerpted from the riots, civil, and criminal disorders hearing before the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations of the Committee on Government Operations, United States Senate, 91st Congress, first session. 
So if you want to get some idea as to the effectiveness of our movement, we can look to, for all intents and purposes, our enemies to see how serious they took us. We took ourselves serious too. I, I, I was one of the students that was a part of that first wave of what was then called special admission students. It was what I believe was the precursor for the educational opportunity program that was later uh, co-opted by the board of trustees for the Calif California State College system. What's important to note is that I, like many others from the black working class, I, I considered myself to be a uh, late achiever. What, I, what that meant was, was because of the fact that my parents, my, my father was a longshoreman, before that a postal worker. And back in those days, if you weren't, if you didn't score a certain uh, score on the uh, IQ test, you were trapped, which basically meant that black working class children were trapped to go into the vocational, educational um, curriculum. If you were middle class, you were on track to go to the state colleges, and if you were a part of the upper middle class or the elite, you were on track to go to the universities California, Stanford, Yale, and so forth and so on. Now, it didn't mean that we weren't intelligent, but what it meant was, was that we were predestined as to where we were going to be. Why train young black people to be doctors and lawyers and so forth when they're not going to be running the country? They're the workers. And so we, who were a part of that first wave of education, what I call special admittance, some would say affirmative action. It was, affirmative action wasn't on the scene at that time, although it was a reality, but special admissions. And I was very happy to be a part of that class because along with me were people like Danny Glover, people like Landon Williams, who was now an economist who graduated from Stanford, and many, many others that I could go on to name, but I can't remember because I'm 66. <laughs> but those are the people who were a part of that group. But what was so important about that group was that the Black Student Union had formulated a program whereby students who had come into San Francisco State who may have been jocks, and I don't have anything against jocks, and people who had other special talents, there was always a special admissions program we in the black community just didn't know anything about it. But it took the Black Student Union to say, we want those slots for people who can do the work, but who haven't been tracked to be those that are going to succeed. And they just didn't open up the doors for anybody to come. There were certain kinds of criteria that you had to meet. You had to go through an orientation process. They wanted you to read certain books, like Black Anglo-Saxons by Dr. Uh, Nathan Hare, The Wretched of the Earth by Dr. Franz Fanon, and many, many other books, the, the autobiograph, uh, autobiograph, autobiography by a graph of, uh, Mar of uh, Malcolm X, and many other books that we had to read. We had to go to orientations to show that we were serious and that we wanted to be able to take advantage of this program. But it didn't end there. We had to actually sit down and go to meetings with people like James Garrity, who was the, uh, the uh, vice president of, the, of academic affairs, I believe, and other deans who were all in a position to say yay or nay to our coming to San Francisco State. So I could say that I had to fight to get in. Nothing was given to us. But in terms of going through that process, it was young people like James Garrett, who is now Dr. James Garrett, PhD uh, attorney, uh, who was uh, the BSC, BSU chairman, uh, BSU chairman-elect Benny Stewart, Jerry Vernardo, uh, George Murray. They were all students uh, and activists and very good students. And it was because of the work 
of them that I stand before you today. But I want to just take you that back to memory lane a, a little bit because before the strike in November of 1968, November 6 has a very significant meaning to me because one year before the strike at San Francisco State, there was an incident called the Gator Incident. How many of you in the audience remember the Gator Incident? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little teaching if I have a moment. What that was all about was the Carnegie Foundation in New York City had extended an invitation to San Francisco State um, College for the service programs, which included a, a number of programs, the Experimental College, the Black Student Union, the, the, uh, the tutorial program. There was many components in that. We were invited to uh, submit a proposal. Well, Mr. James Basco, who was then the editor of the uh, Gator newspaper, he took exception to that. He was the editor and he wrote a uh, scathing editorial about how he thought that it was terrible for this funding to happen because it was funding black student programs. And many people did not like the idea of, of such illustrious uh, writers and artists as uh, Leroy Jones, now known as Amiri Baraka, who was invited to participate as a lecture in resident. And so he wrote this editorial to basically put the kibosh on us getting the money. So we as black students took notice of this and went to pay him a visit. <laughs> and what ensued is what I would call fisticuffs. <laughs> but it was a very political act because we were all suspended. It was nine of us, the San Francisco State Nine. We were suspended, uh, no due process. There was a lot of activism generated around that, which really set the tone for 1968. I'm going to wrap it up because I've got a three-hour speech and only 10 minutes to give it. <laughs> but let me first of all say this, that there's a man sitting in the audience tonight. His name is uh, Terry. Brother Terry Green. Collins. Would you please stand up, Terry Collins? Terry Collins and I. Yes, you are going to stand up, Terry Collins. Terry, Terry Collins and I were really commissioned by the Black Student Union to formulate the, the uh, initial 10 demands. He was the one that introduced me to dialectical materialism. And for you, for you young people who don't know what that is, I'm not going to tell you. Do some research to find out. <laughs> but I will tell you this, that it was essential in terms of the work that we did at San Francisco State. Theory, practice theory. It, he also opened my eyes to the Red Book. He also opened my eyes to things such as dare to struggle, dare to win, which is what we at San Francisco State did. We dared to struggle. We dared to win. We proved that young people, like those in the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Liberation Movement, could make change. And I think that we need to see that struggle at San Francisco State as part of that same continuum. We were young people. We were not just idealistic. We were very practical. And we saw the connection between what was needed in the community and what this institution should be provided to us. We wanted an education that was going to provide to us a true understanding of what this system was about and what it was going to take for us to change it. And we also were in the forefront of advocating for open enrollment, the opposite of what is going on right now today. And my wife has given me the signal to wind it up. <laughs> thank you, dear. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to cut it off. There's much more I can say. All of the activism that I'm doing today is all because of what happened here at, at San Francisco State. Thank you for listening to me. Lorene? <laughs> well, thank you for having us here, and myself included. 
Um, how, why did I get involved in the strike? Well, I think first of all, just by racial uniform, being an Asian American or specifically Chinese American, at that time, I think, you know, in terms of being um, an ethnic group, I still remember that one, we were either invisible as a race, um, or secondly, used as an example for other people of color to emulate. For instance, I, I remember in the, I think it was News Week, oh, no, U.S. World Report, News and World Report said something like when there were the Watts riots, they made the comment like, why can't African Americans or black people be like the Chinese, pull themselves up by the bootstraps, don't complain, just work hard, you know, instead of rioting and not appreciating what has been given to them. So that was kind of the backdrop by which, you know, I was educated during that time in 1966. And yet, at the, the interesting thing about it was I went to this uh, Catholic school in, in San Francisco because I was born and raised here. And very typical of many of the people at that time, I'm what I call 1.5. In other words, my father was born here, but my mom was an immigrant. So I, and he, he was never home because he was always working. And I was basically weird with English as a second language. I didn't go to school with English, even though I'm an American born. And another thing is that my father grew up, was born in 1905, and he grew up during Chinese exclusion. So there's a lot of history there of which we never talked about, of which he never said anything about. And I only had to deduce myself. One, that he never worked outside of Chinatown, even though he spoke perfect English, was a whiz at math, could have been an accountant, asked him, why are you working in Chinatown? Where it was you know, not always pleasant when you have to work with your family. And so, <laughs> and work for your family and get paid by your family. Um, so he, he goes, well, yeah, one time I worked for this white guy and I, I kept his books and um, my father was pristinely dressed. He always had a suit made once a year, wore a fedora hat and et cetera. And he says, well, I was working, and then one day he, he said to me, hey, Charlie, where are you going? And my dad said, well, I, I'm going out to lunch. He goes, oh, okay, good, good. You, you go out to lunch, but don't bother coming back. And that was it. And he was fired, and he didn't, get a, he didn't have a job. So he knew that if he was going to be gainfully employed, he could not trust the white man. And at that time, because it was during Chinese exclusion, Chinese were not allowed to be in labor unions. Chinese were not allowed to be in jobs that were government jobs. The only way you can support yourself was quote unquote in the community. So you fast forward, I, I mean, I was born in the late 40s, but in the 50s, it's pretty much like that was the opportune time for many of the Chinese Americans in terms of getting jobs that were not in the community where they didn't have to be beholding to everybody you know, for everything, and it was kind of freeing for them. And getting a government job was really prized. So for people like myself, it was to study, get an education, and don't make trouble. Culturally, we're a low risk, you know, what do you call it? low risk and anti kind of conflict as a culture in terms of, of quote unquote, dealing with the system. If the system screws you, you just say, oh, suck it up because sucking it up means thousands of rewards later but there's a saying in chinese but young beans and gum in other words you suck it up a hundred times it will become golden so that's the context <laughs> except i you know i also grew up in a time because my mom was catholic i don't know why but you know she's catholic and so we were raised catholic my father didn't believe in anything he believed in ancestral worship so i'm catholic and then i'm also whatever that was and um so she sent me to catholic school and then what was the interesting thing was that the first time i went to catholic school was the first time i dealt with white folks because i grew up in chinatown all the public schools were 99% Chinese, okay, which is unfortunately going back that way. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to Catholic school. I had no idea what race was about, didn't get it, didn't, never had an experience until then. And it was not pleasant. I had people that said, you know, 
oh, those Chinese girls always ruin it for us. They never come to our dances. You know, they don't, you know, participate in mother-daughter fashion shows and mother-daughter breakfast. I mean, my mom was an immigrant. And the way they taught, the, the way they treated immigrants was the fact that she didn't speak English. She looked a little strange, you know, in terms of her hair and her clothing and whatever. And we had girls that dressed from, you know, they had money. You know, they, it was not only class, it was also race. And I was very embarrassed to have a mom. You know, have you ever seen a Chinatown buses? I mean, the 30 Stockton, you see those old ladies? <laughs> that was kind of like my mom, right? I mean, she wasn't coming with me to the mother-daughter fashion show because she didn't know what that was, you know? And whenever she made something for me to wear for free dress days when we didn't have a, a uniform, it was always a little off because I don't know where she got her fashion sense. It was in the sewing factory. You know, that's where she got it. And, they're of like minds, and I was looking weird. And so I was very embarrassed. And so actually, in high school, I became an orphan. I didn't have any parents. You know, I didn't really want to. But I was really pained by the experience of being excluded, of which I never had been before. And what was worse was that I was, I asked my mom, why was I treated differently? No one would talk to me. I didn't have friends, except for the two Chinese girls that were from the community, and I tried to make friends. I thought I was pleasant enough, but I just, they just didn't connect with me. And, and the one time that they labeled me as the Chinese girl that ruined it for them, I think that did it. That really, that really made me think about, well, what is going on here? And then, fortunately, it was the same time that there's Martin Luther King, there was also you know, people like Malcolm X, and there was also these stories and things that were all over the news. And of course, I gravitated there. And when my mother saw that, she probably had a heart attack. But she didn't really know what was going on because she didn't speak <coughs> English. She just knew I was watching a lot about the civil rights movement. She saw, she says, don't you ever go there. Look at how those people are getting beat up. I go, oh, I'm not doing anything. And then when I... <laughs> And when I went to meetings at San Francisco State for the Third World Liberation Front, and I was always late going home because we had all these little strategy meetings, you know, go home at 2 o'clock in the morning and blah, blah, blah. She goes, where were you? Oh, I had to study. Oh. <laughs> I had a lot of tests, you know. <laughs> and she goes, okay, good, good, good. Until the day I got her, until there was one day was this mass arrest. And then my brother, who's the good son, let's just laugh and say, I bet you your daughter's there, mom. And my mother, oh, no, 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 no. She would never do anything like that. Never, 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 never. And I didn't get home till 6 in the morning because I had to wait to be bailed out. Okay. So at that point, I couldn't lie. You know, I said blah, blah, blah. And of course, I got cussed out royally. Mm. And to make it worse was that I, she said to me something very interesting. She goes, are you dumb? Are you dumb or what? And I'm going, I don't know. How, why are you saying that? I said, because, you know, Mom, this is not fair, the way they treat Chinese people. And it's not just Chinese. It's black people. It's Native Americans. It's, you know, um, Chicanos and blah, blah, blah. And she goes, who cares? You know, that kind of thing. You're supposed to be going to school. I said, I am. But then her whole thing was that, you know, you don't, she goes, have you ever seen that woman in the scale of justice, that woman that carries the scale for justice? And I go, yes. And that scale is weighed by principles. Principles that are, has the bottom line of right and wrong, fair and unfair. She goes, oh, that's very nice. <laughs> and you know what, daughter? It's actually weighed by money. If you have money, that's where you're going to get the justice. I'm going, no, that's not true. In fact, it's so not true, I'm going for a jury trial. <laughs> I was, these guys are laughing. So at any rate, you know, we were separated into small groups, you know, and we, people were asking us, should we cop a plea? Should we go for a jury trial? Blah, blah, blah. And I was in one of the earlier groups. I'm very idealistic. I really believed in the principles of this, this is my right to protest. He had no right to arrest us. So I went in the early group and we demanded a jury trial. And then other people copped the plea and whatever. It didn't matter. But unfortunately, we didn't have money, so we had the public defender. 
We didn't have a lot of things. And they were great guys. They did the best they could. But I got 20 days in jail. So maybe my mother was right. I don't know. But it didn't matter because I felt I was right. And I felt it was my right. And, you know, to the day that she passed away, which was a couple of years ago, she had always been very, very embarrassed by that episode in my life. And, but I'll say one thing. For, I, I think what's interesting is that my mom did come around. I mean, she, she never believed in voting. And because, and when bilingual ballots came, I made her go. And she was okay, good, I'll go, you know. She always voted for the ethnic candidates. Because I go blah, 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 blah. And then she's like, okay, I'll do that. Um, and she kind of like got it later, understand, because we would have conversations about it. And I think one of the interesting thing about it is that when I went, when I, I was, I mean, you know, we have a very small community in Chinatown, even in the 60s and 70s, before the large immigration in the late 60s. People knew your business. And unfortunately, my name was in the Chinese newspaper as saying going to jail, except that they didn't know my Chinese name. They kind of go Jiu Lo Lin or something like that. So no, you know, they kind of used my English name as a Chinese name. And I think I have a lot of cousins, I think, that were teased me. I was called a jailbird for I don't know how many years. But it was interesting that she, you know, all my American, all my cousins are American born. She's the only immigrant that was here. And she said to them, you know, my daughter may have been not too bright <laughs> by getting caught. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you this. She went to jail and she did not steal. She did not hurt anyone. She went to jail because she believed in something. Not that I agree. But she is not a criminal. So all of you just, because when she spoke, it was like, you know. So I think, you know, my motivation was that because of the time, you know, with Kennedy saying, you don't ask what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. With people like, for me, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were really important for me. And the whole issue of like, being idealistic to the point that we can change anything and everything, just as long as we work hard on it and not give up. You know, that is such a key spirit of the country at this time. We felt that, you know, we had optimism. We had something that is called like, compromising is not bad. We learned how to work together. And now after 9-11, all we have is fear and cynicism which is a very different type of thinking, you know, of the times. And so, you know, I, I think for the last 40 years, all of us, in, I, I agree with Clarence, if the strike changed my life. You know, no matter what position I held or did or whatever, <laughs> you know, worked in, it was, I always remember why I'm here. And the bottom line, it is about access and how I can help students know and become more than what they are now. And also to, in any way that I can, whether as faculty, chair, associate dean, if I can help them navigate through this system where it's not always supportive, that's why I'm here. And it's all because of a simple point in history called the San Francisco State Strike. I'm racing back and forth because it does it in 12 minute oh. slices. So, okay. Hi. So, Roger. Uh, yeah. Um, what got me involved was a four letter word called work. Uh, from the time that I was seven years old, I went to work. And uh, it, I learned. I learned what there is when you go to work. I was outside of San Francisco General Hospital hollering, uh, get your San Francisco news. And this guy from the shed just around the corner says, hey, kid, what do you want? Shut up, there are people inside, they're sick and they're trying to sleep. I learned, right? I want to sell papers, but you know I don't want to get fired in the process. 
I can't tell you the number of people that I worked with that had the influence and impact on me other than to uh, appreciate how unfair uh, so many things are. I came to San Francisco State as an accident. All of my friends were in the university prep uh, program in high school. And because they were, I was. And when it came time to apply to school, they went to school, I went to work. And I received this notice from San Francisco State. I said, well, you know, you're eligible. And I said, okay, I'll go, All right? It took me three semesters to pass Bonehead English. <laughs> and the only reason I passed is because I missed the last day of the test, the third time. And I ran back into school and ran into the uh, TA, and she said to me, why don't you go ahead and sit down and take the test again? And she passed me, so I stayed. <laughs> I have the distinction of probably having flunked out of this school more than anybody else, <laughs> and also uh, invited back in. I had burned out my student deferments by the time 64, 65 had come along. I ran into the dean of students, Ferg Riddell. He asked me what my status was. I told him. He said, come on back. I'll get you into school. During that time, I had gotten to know Riddell and a number of people, not only in the administration, but in the faculty, through the student programs that I worked in. I initially got involved in the San Francisco State Student Tutorial Program. Spent three years working in that program, and the second year became involved with the high school students, and was so impressed by their capacities, talents, interests, and energies in working with younger children, we put together a proposal for a special admissions of 25 students that were to be brought in under the president of the school's uh, option. Apparently, he had a 1.6% admissions allowance where he could allow students to come into the campus that didn't meet the typical criteria. I believe the year was 66 when the program was initially started. And it was during this time that uh, the so-called Bed of Roses of the movement had got pretty seriously disrupted. There were not only the assassinations that had occurred, but there was also the development of the black identity that came to the fore, as well as Malcolm X and his positions and specifically, I think, his position in regards to self-determination. Here was the first time that we've had somebody articulating for us a direction and a way in which to see ourselves becoming fulfilled in ways that we weren't finding possible on the campuses. One of the things that we realized in the student programs, and, I, and I'll just run through the list of it so you can have an idea of the scope of what was going on and the extent to which people were involved outside of the school. There was a tutorial program which had over 400 kids in the San Francisco School District that were being tutored twice a week for two to three hours at a time in 28 different locations throughout the school. We had a staff within the program that numbered almost 30, and all of those 30 people were being paid. It was the work study program, and it was money being used by associated students that made it possible for that to happen. None of this stuff comes out of a vacuum. And part of that was the reality in the early 60s when students realized that if they ran and could control student government, we could have something to say about where the associated student money went. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. The tutorial program was generated and running. The community involvement program was generated and running by uh, Del, Del Sorensen, who was a, a social worker working in San Francisco, who involved people in various community programs throughout the Bay Area. It was also the experimental college program that was put together, which enabled people to come in and sign up and teach courses of their particular interest. And the only requirement was that you have a minimum of six to 12 students, depending upon the, whatever the particular subject was concerned. There was also the student evaluation of professors that was run by students that, that went on as well. And it was the first time, I believe, in a US university or college where there was actually a survey taken of the students to grade the professors in regards to their ability to teach and to convey their message. The Black Student Union came into development and took over, I believe, it was the American Negro Association. 
And it was during this time that black identity came to the fore. And I don't think any program was impacted more than the tutorial program was at that time. Because that program, the internal organization and membership of that program literally went through an incredibly intense and difficult time trying to resolve their liberal notions in regards to realizing and appreciating the fact that people that they cared about and were concerned for wanted to be left on their own, to have their own sense of identity and they're determined for themselves their own direction, needs, and purposes. It wasn't until the summer of 66, when it was finally resolved that there needed to be a change within the tutorial program and that the direction of the program be driven to include leadership from the Black Student Union, which is what developed, and from that came the Burke Study Program. The Burke Study Program was specifically designed to take students with their particular interests in a discipline, put them into an area of work in the area, in the Bay Area, and to have classes run that would orient them, orientate to and relate to them directly in the particular work that they were involved in. What all of this stuff meant to those of us that were here at the time was that we developed a, a, an, a critical analysis of where things were at that was based upon the conditions of reality and what those realities meant in regards to the things that we wanted to see happen. I left the campus in 67. I went to work with some uh, teenage gangs in the Mission District, specifically the Golden Diablos on 16th and Shotwell. I came back to the campus in the summer of 68, got involved with the Latin American Student Organization, we joined the t Third World Liberation Front, and was as assigned as one of the spokesmen along with Ron Kitiche for the Third World Liberation Front. Again, it was, never a, it was not always a bed of roses. There were, there were always times when there were issues and not all parties agreed. There were times when people would storm out of the meeting only to come back an hour and a half later and continue the dialogue. There were moments when there, we didn't know whether or not things were gonna continue and we were gonna be able to make things happen. But looking at the posters outside before I came in here, I recall that the boost you got when you were out there demonstrating and you were out there trying to keep people together who were all wanting to go in various tangents, the sense of unity and identity that those posters gave us all were really something that helped to meld us uh, and, and to continue to hold the ideals that we, that we held together to see what, what we could do and, and how we could make it happen. I remember sitting down with Ali Odo in some meeting in an archbishop's office, and the arrogance of this man was just unbelievable. I mean, you know, you would have thought we were all three-year-olds being told to eat our mush. <laughs> it, it, well, at the same time, the reality of the fact was that this man wanted to be governor. I mean, this, and this is, where, this is where the play is, right? This is where the play is. This is what it is, right? Reagan wanted to send in the troops. He was a governor of California. He was, a, he was a Republican. Eliotta was a Democrat, and he had gubernatorial aspirations. So he was not allowed, about to allow Reagan to bring the troops into his city. It was his city. His machine, his city. You can see the same thing happening today in Oakland. Gene Kwan beat out the Democratic machine candidate, and they have never forgotten that. The first two years of her, group, of her mayoral position, every day there was an article in there attacking Jean Kwan and, and the whole fact that she got elected. And they continue that to, to, to today, right? This, that's what it was like then, and it's still what it's like now in regards to fairness and the lack of fairness and why fairness should be a concern. My kids used to tell me years, 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 it's not fair, Dad, it's not fair. And I always, well, so what? You know, I say, you're right, it isn't fair. And finally, you know, I, I, got, I got smart enough to figure it out, right? They were right. It's not fair. And when you address things not being fair, then you put yourself in a position to do something. You don't have to go out and throw a rock through a window, but you can do a lot more than sit on your hands. And I think that that's the kind of place where we are now. 
You know, everybody's sitting on their hands waiting to see who's going to make the next move. Well, I think some of the things about history that I think that are really play uh, and, and have significance uh, are reflected in what happened. There were demonstrations against the draft in Oakland that went on for weeks. There were so many people in the streets they couldn't move the buses with the guys that they had drafted out of Oakland. And that happened in so many places around the country. The upswell of that happened in so many places around the country. They did away with the draft. That doesn't mean they did away with the military budget. Over 50% of our money goes to the military. And our young people are still being sent overseas to kill people that look like them. And we still have no resolution for how we can get ourselves taken care of. How is it that we cannot have a single payer health plan? Why is it we cannot have a single payer health plan? How is it that we can give $800 billion to people who have squandered and gambled our money away? Our money. They didn't just gamble $800 million away. We paid them $800 million for doing it. We paid $1,600 million. We live in, we live in a corruption that is, uh, what do you say, totally uh, co-optive. Totally co-opted. There's a small book called Three Principles of, 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 of uh, I want to say patience, but I don't think patience is, is the right word. But, it, but what it deals with is, is that this is, this, is how, this is how the system operates. It has the capacity to wait you out, and to buy you out individually, and eventually just absorb and, 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 ro and roll you over. Roll you over with your own <coughs> stuff, your own, your own system. I would encourage all of us to consider the generation gap as a farce, to appreciate us as a family, and to understand that the things that we have in common are, are our bond. And the more that we share those things with each other, the more we're going to find that capacity to do things together for ourselves and for each other that really uh, will make uh, the School of Ethnic Studies, just a small shadow of what we have the capacity to do. So I, I look forward to uh, my faith in everybody and, and the, gen the, the energy that that, 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 can, that can bring forth uh, a difference, a difference for all of us and the way in which we uh, live and share uh, our love for one another. I'm going to fill in for Dan. <laughs> um, I want to thank the panelists all very much for coming. And, um, and just note that we could do this for many more hours. Sorry. <laughs> That we could we could do this for many hours. We had several more questions we were going to ask, um, and unfortunately, we don't have the time. Um, and so we're going to conclude now. I think this just indicates the the need to have this ongoing dialogue. I really deeply appreciate Roger's concluding remarks, and want people to take that to heart. The activism is not something from the past, that it's ongoing, that we're all capable in small ways and big ways and everything in between, and we have an obligation to ourselves and to our community to do that. And so I want to thank all of you for the beautiful work that you've done in the past and the work that you continue to do today. Um, and thank you all for coming. We are, um, there's a class that's actually part of the audience today, and the class continues after the break. And if people want to stay, there will be another strike veteran giving a presentation, and then there'll also be a presentation about the Bay Area Television Archive. So if you're really into it, you can stay. <laughs> um, otherwise, the, the uh, program is going to wrap up. And um, I would offer more food, but the food's all gone, too. <laughs> it's meeting in here, yes. OK? And in 10 minutes, there'll be a break um, as we wrap up now. But thank you all for coming. And